At this time, let's begin today's webinar from Scary Conversations to Meaningful Dialogue. With that, I'll hand the presentation over to your moderator, Tanya Cervoni with Canadian Management Center. Tanya, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jessica. Welcome, everyone. I'm super excited to moderate this conversation. As Jessica said, my name is Tanya Trevoni. I'm a senior practice leader with Canadian Management Center. My background is in all things leadership development, organizational design, coaching, and the reason I'm so excited today is because I know this conversation is going to be a great one. We've had a ton of folks register, so we know this conversation does resonate with a lot of people. And Part of the reason I'm uh, excited that I know it's going to be so good is because we have a fabulous guest speaker today. Her name is Lisa Mitchell. You can read more about Lisa and myself in the bio widget, but I want to say up front that Lisa is a facilitator with CNC. She's also the president of Green Apple Consulting, and she brings over 25 years of experience across a variety of industries as a corporate leader. She's been a former vice president, and she's also an executive coach. And as it relates to today's topic, Lisa spent a lot of years coaching folks like yourselves, leaders, employees in a multitude of organizations, and her focus has been on helping them improve their effectiveness at having feedback conversations and really engaging in any kind of performance, performance conversations. So whether that be sharing recognition or having really challenging critical conversations, Lisa is extremely skilled at helping people breakthrough in these areas because we know that it can be really challenging. And she's got a few short stories to share about how she's done that and how you can do that as well. But before I hand things over to Lisa, I have a couple of quick comments to share. The first is that uh, if you are on Twitter, we invite you to follow us. Our handle is at Canadian Management. And I invite you to tweet any of the insights that you're getting today. Our hashtag is CMC Events. As Jessica mentioned, this session is be being recorded, and the recording will allow you to view the slides. So if you have to drop off early or if you want to share this with a colleague, just know that you'll be receiving that after the webinar. So at this time, it's, it's time to just jump right in. So our focus of this conversation is how to make feedback conversations less scary, more productive, and more impactful. And we really want to personalize this topic for you. So we're going to open the conversation with a reflection question. And for that, I'm going to pass the floor over to Lisa. So we'd like to help you connect to the content personally. So to start us off, I'd like you to think of someone that you struggle giving feedback to. So if you have that person in, in your mind, please give me a yes in the Q&A panel. Now, now that you've got that person in mind, reflect on what stops you from having a feedback conversation with this person. And now I want you to consider what could you achieve if you were able to have an authentic conversation with them. Now, these questions are designed to really help us think about the cost of not engaging in meaningful feedback or performance conversations. And we'll revisit the answers as we go along. So as we know, these conversations aren't easy, and hence why you're here today. In fact, performance management and performance conversations are top priority for organizations. Yes, absolutely, and, and it's, it's funny. I'm just seeing a ton of yeses pop up instantly on the screen. So it didn't seem to be a struggle for many of you to think of someone that you are struggling to get feedback to, so you're in the right place. Yes, so according to Deloitte, the redesign of performance management is actually picking up Speed. So 79% of executives rated as a high priority, and now this is up from 71% just a few years ago. So despite the number of years that we've all been talking about performance management and we've been streamlining our processes, maybe our documentation, it's still a top priority for organizations, and in fact, it's growing. And it's growing because it's, it's really a key vehicle for all of us to develop the talent that we need for the future. So this is why this conversation is so important. And this is why it's also critical for us to understand what still remains in the way. Despite all the progress we've made, we still aren't where we want to be as it relates to performance conversations. 
So we asked you this question, actually. Uh, many of you gave us responses on the registration survey, so thank you for that. We asked you specifically, what, do you, what, what are the top two to three things that, you know, stop managers or leaders from having meaningful performance conversations with their people? And this is what you had to say. Now, this is just a sample of some of the most frequent responses. You can see fear of conflict, poor listening, low confidence no training and experience, lack of skill. Now keep in mind, things like lack of skill also represented people who said things like, leaders don't know how to start the conversation, um, they don't have the skills to hold the conversation, or they've not seen positive role models on how to give or receive feedback. Um, folks who said fear of conflict also mentioned things like being afraid of emotional outbursts or fear of upsetting people. Some of you even said that it's our egos that get in the way. So there are a lot of great comments uh, to this question, but I invite you to consider that regardless of the words that we use to describe the barriers to these conversations, many of them can actually be distilled into three key obstacles, and Lisa's going to break those down for us now. So our obstacles really boil down to three elements. In particular, we can start with one, neurological wiring, followed by two, social conditioning, and three, lack of skill. So all of these link back to fear, or at least lack of confidence. And that might explain why most of us typically avoid these uncomfortable conversations, or if we do engage in them, the result is sometimes minimal impact, or even in some cases, further disengagement. So it's interesting because Psychology Today, today did a survey and found that one-third of performance reviews actually result in decreased employee performance, which is sad. <laughs> so we, we can do better than this. So let's address each of these obstacles briefly and then move into some strategies uh, to, to get by them. So some of you uh, have heard the, the saying lizard brain when it comes to neurological wiring. Some people call it monkey brain. So this is really the, the, the fact that, you know, back in the caveman days, uh, this monkey brain was meant to protect us really from danger and we're wired to move away from things that we find threatening. Unfortunately, this lizard monkey brain doesn't differentiate between what might be a physical threat, so some bear coming to attack us, um, and a psychological one, which could be going into performance review. So because the physiological response is the same, our rational brain, is, uh, our thinking is compromised in the face of a threat. So this is why our brains can literally get dumbed down when we have this physiological response. On top of that, compounding our neurological wiring is our social conditioning. So how many of you can finish this sentence for me? If you don't have something nice to say, I'll speak on behalf of our audience and say, don't say anything at all. I heard this loud and clear. Oh, yeah, my Nana used to literally say that. She was very prim and proper. So, you know, many of us are taught to value harmony, community, strong social relationships. Nothing wrong with that. And it makes good evolutionary sense because we've been reliant on other people or our tribe or family for survival over the course of history. So it, it makes sense that anything that could threaten that connection with other people can feel like a threat to our survival. And that includes giving feedback that might make someone dislike us. I remember actually the first time hearing that, it made a lot of sense. I was like, why is it so scary uh, to give feedback? But it's, it's in our DNA yep. through our evolution. So that's the good news and the bad news. Now we're aware of it. Well, it's so true. So what's the cost, though, of avoiding these conversations, right, of giving in to the the neurological wiring and the social conditioning, you know, of being too nice to give constructive feedback. Well, many of you are in HR or OD on the line, and, uh, you know, you know that nice sounds good on the surface, but there can be a dark side to it. So we see examples of this play out all the time in organizations. So I can think of times when I've managed talent acquisition in, in, in various companies, and, you know, sometimes we've had um, – uh, a process, if you will, where if somebody wanted to apply for an internal position somewhere else in the company, in another department, they had to have their current manager sign off on the application. And in many cases, I can tell you, the manager has signed off saying, yes, I approve of you applying for this other role, and then in the meantime, they go behind the person's back and tell HR or talent acquisition or the hiring manager, don't hire this person. 
Um, you know, and that's not uh, being nice. That's, that's going underground and holding people back. So similarly, within the context of performance conversations, we often avoid the conversations because we want to avoid our own discomfort. Um, you know, we think the other person might get upset or it might escalate into conflict that we don't feel equipped to handle. So, you know, that could be why in, a, in a, another survey reported on Forbes, um, they looked at a thousand people who had been fired from their job. And crazy, 75% said their manager never met with them to discuss their concerns before firing them. And here's the irony. Avoiding these conversations and not giving people feedback that will help them grow is anything but nice. Nice is doing what's in the best interest of the other person. Renee Brown, uh, she says it best in her most recent book, Dare to Lead. Clear is kind, unclear is unkind. And this is an important distinction for leaders. And when I'm in the classroom and working with people individually uh, in my coaching practice, I find this is kind of a, actually it's a bit of a mic drop moment for a lot of people mm -hmm. where they, they, they kind of realize like, oh my goodness, if I care enough to be you know, clear with somebody to help them get an A, then actually being kind. It's kind of that notion of tough love, right? There's, yeah. It's difficult, but you're doing it from the right place. Exactly, exactly. So you're clear on your intention in this case. So I'd like to invite everybody on the line. Give me a yes in the, the Q&A pa panel if you can think of a time you personally fell short of being completely clear, completely candid with someone, even though you know, knew it was the right thing to do. Just looking to see what comes up here. You know, we've all been here. We can see some of the responses starting to, to bubble up. You know, and yet the work of leaders, their actual accountability is to help people excel. And we can't do this without being clear and direct with them. You know, helping people get an A takes feedback. So, and being clear certainly takes courage as well. And in addition to courage, it also takes skill. Yes, and, and I'm noticing there are a lot of comments coming up, a lot of people uh, that can that can relate to that. So, you know, we're all sort of in the same boat, but let's talk a little bit more about skill then. In our experience w working with tons of leaders, there are really three key things. I mean, there's more than three, but there's three that we want to talk about here that we fail to do well when we're either unskilled or sometimes simply inexperienced in these conversations. And the first is that we fail to position the conversation properly to create safety. Sometimes we just lunge right into it, um, which you know triggers the, the lizard brain that Lisa just talked about. Number two is that we don't ask questions. We can spend a lot of time talking at employees. And in fact, it's interesting, when you look at the organizations that have really started to evolve their performance management practices, it's really been focusing on moving to more of a two-way dialogue. The, um, the HRO of Accenture was quoted as saying, you know, they now talk with people in frequent coaching conversations versus talking about them in closed door rating meetings. So this is one of the mistakes that we make. Uh, the third one can be that when we do ask questions, we either ask the wrong questions, so we ask why questions, like why did you fail to get this done, which can trigger defensiveness, or if we do ask a really good question, we don't leave space for the response, especially when that question might be a difficult one for the employee to answer and there's sort of that uncomfortable silence. There's this tendency to want to fill that airtime because of the discomfort. So between our neurological wiring, our social conditioning, and a lack of experience, we are facing a lot of barriers. But the good news is we have a few solutions. We didn't come here just to uncover the challenges. And the thing we want to address first and foremost is what is the number one thing you can do to get past your fear and resistance and have a clear and kind conversation? So we are about to unveil what we have labeled our secret sauce. If there's nothing else you do after this <laughs> webinar, we suggest you do this. So I'm going to pass it back to, to Lisa to unveil the secret. Yes, and we'll tell you where to buy it at the end. Um, right. So it's easy to... Know your positive intent for the conversation and to state it up front. So, Tanya, if I say to you, I'd like to give you some feedback on your presentation, how does that? Probably a little nervous. I'm probably going right away to what did I miss or what did I do wrong? Yeah, and it's a pretty innocuous statement. I, you know, can I give you some feedback? 
But you don't know what my intention is in that particular case. And the second thing is, you know, we often are predisposed to think the purpose of feedback is to tell us when we're falling short. So what if I change it up and I said to you, Tanya, that was a solid presentation that you gave. Let's debrief and discuss what went well and explore ideas for how you can have an even greater impact next time. So how does that change the dynamic for you? Well, to be honest, I think it has me lean into the conversation a little bit more and actually listen, because the minute you start talking about let's, let's come up with ideas on how to be better, that speaks to, I mean, that's motivating to me. So I'm more likely, I think, to listen versus being already um, kind of arming myself for how I'm going to defend whatever it is that you tell me I've done wrong. Like, that's how I would have felt with the first sentence. So this one makes me want to actually explore it with you. Right, and it's, it's, yeah, we're trying to create a sense of safety. So identifying and stating a positive intent for the conversation really demonstrates, you know, that as a leader, you're invested in your employee's development, and that helps calm that lizard brain down, and it, it sh helps shift from judger mindset to, to learner mindset. So this is a step that we often miss. I see this all the time when I'm doing uh, leadership development workshops, and people just not knowing that positioning this, putting this up front, really makes a huge difference to leveling the fear. And, and that fear often comes from the power imbalance. There's a natural power imbalance of tension between manager and employee. So, Tanya, you had another good example when we were talking earlier about how lizard brain shows up. Yeah, I was thinking about the power differential. So, I work for CNC, obviously, but I'm physically located in the U.S. So I have a lot of opportunity to cross the border, and I was thinking about this. Is this, you know, those of you who've had this opportunity to go through customs, you know, you're approaching the border. You know, you're not doing anything illegal. Like I don't, you know, this morning when I came across the border, I didn't have anything in the, you know, in the trunk of my car. And yet, as you start to, you know, to approach, like I find my heart starts to race a little bit, a little bit sweaty palms because I don't. You know, I don't know what that person's going to say, and they have the power to, you know, ruin my day depending on how they decide to deal with me. And and I was thinking about our conversation because it's not that dissimilar to a manager-employee dynamic or manager-leader because of that power differential. And that's why this this topic around intention, if you know what someone wants to share and why they want to share it, it starts to... Uh, level the playing field and bring it more into a partnership or a dialogue versus someone having power over someone else. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we can bring this conversation back to all of you who are listening to help you see the effect of the, the power of intention in your in your own lives with this, this next question. Yeah, so I, I'd like to invite everybody to think of someone in your life, lives with whom you can be 100% candid. You experience little to no fear in being candid with them. So hopefully everybody's got a face popping up <laughs> inside their mind. Now, I want you to tell me, type it in the Q&A panel if you're so inclined, what allows that to happen? Why is it so easy to be open and honest with this person? Let's see what comes up here. We'll give people a few seconds to respond. Um, and it's interesting. So that person can be, you know, it can, it's the same question whether it's someone in your personal life or whether it's someone that you work with, maybe the best leader you ever had, um, you know, what allowed you to either be candid with them or even receive feedback from them because it's the, it's the same thing. So I see some people, um, let me just click here on what's coming through. Okay. So I'm seeing a lot of references to the word trust, wow. or faith, there's no judgment, trust, 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 they are very accepting, um, trust, thank you, Megan, and thank you, Cynthia, trust, like, just, yeah, trust seems to be um, no judgment, respect, relationship, yeah, so a real the same theme. themes are coming up, and, you know, um, Get comfortable, trusting relationship. Okay, so we're hearing you loud and clear. Thank you for those of you who are participating. You know, you know what it makes me think of too is with with my husband. So he and I, you know, are really able able to tolerate each other when we're not our best selves because we're clear. Right word. Well, well, we know what each other's intention is. We, you know, there's, sure. there's that innate trust. On top of that, though, I will say that over the years, you know, 20 years together, we've actually learned to state it. You know, I know I'm a bit grumpy today. My intention is not to, you know, irritate.
Yeah, so we actually are quite open with stating that, and, and that has really helped and gone a long way. Now, the interesting thing is, you know, we're not going to trust each other instantly just because we ask, right? So there's some really important ingredients in our secret sauce that I think it would be helpful to, to break these down. So the key ingredients, so let's look at them. There's three magical ones. The first one is curiosity. Second one is vulnerability. And the third one is candor. So let's start off with curiosity. Why would you suggest curiosity is a, is a magical ingredient? Well, the first reason is because asking meaningful questions communicates that you care, you're interested. And secondly, caring helps you align your intent with the impact you seek. So we all have best intentions. And sometimes, though, our impact is not what we intended. So when we demonstrate that we care and we come from a place of curiosity, those two things align much better. Because often we talk at employees, Tanya mentioned that earlier, versus dialoguing with them. And that runs contrary to the intention of coaching for growth. So genuine curiosity really opens up dialogue. And, and it, you know, we could share so much on just curiosity, of course, but I think it might be useful if we looked at our real example. Yeah, I'm happy to share an example, but I will make one comment first. You know, sometimes we struggle, some of us, to use the word care in a in a work environment. So that's what I love about, there's many ways, I mean, you don't have to wake up and say I love you to your employees, you know, but demonstrating it through questions uh, is just a really good way to think about how to build that trust. Because I'm seeing, going back to some of the comments that you put in here, you know, the person is approachable and you have a relationship with the person. So you can't have a relationship with someone if you're not asking questions about them. And this is something that one of our participants, um, Sam, learned in one of our coaching programs. So he's someone who was recently promoted to a management role with a technical expert, and he knew that his one-on-one -on -one meetings were just okay, but he wasn't feeling great about them, and he wanted to do something different. So he started to use questioning and bringing more of a coaching, curious mindset to his one-on-one -on -one meetings. And he shared this um, feedback with us that he gave us permission to, to use. And I'm just going to read it out for anyone who may be listening to this recording after the fact. And he said, you know, using the strategies from the course, they started to ask a lot more questions. I tried to get a better understanding of my employees' future goals, what interested them the most, what their challenges were, and what they wanted to learn. The tough part was the silence that followed. At first, people didn't know what to say or they didn't feel comfortable saying it, but I didn't fill in the blank space. It was definitely uncomfortable. It paid off. People started making suggestions for solving long-standing problems and sharing their interests and becoming generally more involved in goal discussions. So a bit of a long quote, but I thought it was an excellent example of a couple things we've been talking about. Number one, he was able to show his employees that he cared because it was becoming a dialogue. It was becoming about them and asking those questions. And if you think about it, you know, employees want relevant feedback. So any future feedback that Sam is going to be able to give employees and tie it back to some of the answers they would have provided in those conversations, it's going to have that feedback carry more weight and it's going to seem more authentic and more relevant. And this he was able to do. He was willing to sit in the discomfort of the silence. His people weren't used to him asking the kinds of questions he was asking. So at first, they either A, didn't know the answer, or maybe some of them didn't even trust why he was asking, right, because this was a change in behavior. But he gave them the space to step up to it, and at, over time, it paid off. So, so often, I think as leaders, we feel we need to demonstrate that we have all the answers, especially if we're a new leader like Sam is, and that we need to give people direction. But if we can shift the dynamic into doing more telling, um, sorry, more asking versus telling, um, despite whatever uncomfort, discomfort comes up, you know, it completely changes the dynamic. And I'm sure, Lisa, as, as a coach, that's something you see all the time. And I'm guessing it's probably one of the things you coach leaders on. Oh, absolutely. Even in the coaching context, you know, often when I ask a question, you know, often people say, well, I don't know. And I might say, okay, well, let's just sit with that. Yeah, don't let them off the hook, and it's hard, right? Because we don't like to be uncomfortable because somebody else is uncomfortable, and then we tend to just talk to fill airtime. It's true. And and in the end, though, people will 
speak up. And often they only need five to seven seconds to kind of formulate what their response is right in the moment and be able to articulate it back. So we have to give them that time if we want a thoughtful response. We do have a tough question before we oh, go on. Yeah, are you ready for it? <laughs> um, I hope I'm saying the name right. Anil asks, what if someone had a bad experience with this person? How could you rebuild lost trust? So I don't know if we're talking about a bad experience with the leader, maybe, or with the employee. So I don't know if we want to save it and come back to trust. Well, you know what? I think I think we can maybe respond to that really quickly, whether it is, you know, the, the employee lost trust in their leader or vice versa. I think it comes down to once there's that understanding that there is a, a disconnect is, is, uh, is naming it, is actually stepping into it and saying, okay, clearly – something's broken down between us. Let's look at it with a curious lens and figure out where did things fall off the rails and what would it look like, starting to visualize, what would it look like if we could get the train back on the track? Yeah. Right. How do we move forward? Yeah, and I think it's sometimes difficult calling that out. So I, I'm not sure 100% the intention there uh, with the question, but I'm thinking, putting myself in the shoes of an employee, if I have a leader that I felt did something to break trust and now they're asking me questions and asking me to share more about my interests and my goals and things and I'm not trusting that person, if there's a way to, like you said, identify it when this happens, you know, this is how it made me feel and now I'm feeling a little bit, you know, gun shy to, to open up, so we need to explore that. And those are uncomfortable conversations to have and we're in the perfect place because we have some more information to share that can make those conversations um, a little bit uh, easier. So hang tight. Um, and this actually brings us to the second, our second ingredient. Yeah. Vulnerability. <laughs> so again, Brene Brown, she's a bit of a hero for, for us. Uh, she talks a lot about the power of vulnerability. There's a TED Talk even on it. Um, this is really the concept, though, of being human. Uh, not of of opening yourself up to um, attack or embarrassment or shame. It's about being human. So it's um, a powerful way to communicate that you're not all-knowing, right? A way to create safety is by admitting when you don't have all the answers. So one of the, the most powerful ways to demonstrate vulnerability as it relates to feedback is to start with you. So ask, actually ask for advice and solicit that feedback. And for leaders, this is tricky. You've got to remember that because of that power um, tension that exists, that's very real, we have to solicit and give space for people to offer us feedback. They're, they're usually, if we say, any feedback for me, they're going to say, no, no, I'm good, I'm good, <laughs> right? Typically, they're going to take the easy way out. Whereas if you get really specific, instead of asking a broad or closed question, you make it easy for them to give you something that's, that's um, bite-sized and workable. So it might sound like, you know, I'm working on my, my meeting facilitation skills for our team meetings. What is one thing that I could do differently from your perspective? You know, make it manageable, and over time they'll get more comfortable with broader questions, like how am I doing in general? What's one thing I could change that would make your life easier on the team? I think that's that's really great because when you you first share that to me, I was thinking about the number of times I've been guilty to just say, do you have any feedback for me? And that just feels too big and too scary because you're like, okay, so I'm thinking something in my head, but I don't know if that's what she's really looking for. But the minute you zone into something specific, I'd be like, okay, I can talk about your meeting facilitation skills or I can talk about one thing you could do to support me better as an employee. You narrow it down and it's somehow the scope of it is just more manageable. Yeah, well, part of creating safety is making things manageable and realistic and bite-sized so people can wrap their head around it. Yeah, love it. So, okay, so then the other thing to consider, too, is that it's, it's, oh, it's okay to admit when a conversation is making you nervous or uncomfortable because it actually allows the other person to acknowledge their fear and discomfort as well. So that can create connection. Um, so it might sound like you know, I, I want to chat with you about the fact that you had a really poor result the past quarter in terms of your sales results. And, and you know, it, it feels a bit uncomfortable for me to sit down with you around this, and, I, and it probably is uncomfortable for you too. It's really important we reflect on and learn from what went wrong, and I'm, I'm committed to supporting you and turning this around. And so you've – so that's sort of an example of what it might sound like. That's Lisa speak, so you'd have to yeah. put your own stamp on it. 
and yet when you actually help people say, you know, this is a bit a bit yucky for both of us in a sense, a bit uncomfortable, and yet it's offered in the spirit of helping you get even better, right, or getting back on track as the case may be. And that's a very specific example. And I'm thinking even in terms of those um, those of us who maybe haven't been having these kinds of conversations with our people, even being able to say, like I'm thinking about Sam in the example, if Sam were to say, I want to have more dialogue. I want to have more engaging one-on-one -on -one meetings. With you. I'm not an expert at doing that. This is kind of new to me. And I mean, it might take a lot of vulnerability to just say, I want to change the dynamics of our conversation because I want you to leave feeling more motivated. That might be a stretch for people, but to admit that. And then I think we're much more likely to give people slack because we know they're trying and they're just being real, you know? Yes. Do you, do you know that that makes me think of whenever I'm uh, facilitating a workshop with leaders I often, as part of their action planning at the end of the, the course, is to encourage them to consider how can you bring this back in reality with your team. Right. And it might be, hey, I went to this course on X, right. and here's some of what I was learning. Here's what I'm thinking about in terms of applying it. Can you help me with that? Right. Because what a better way to demonstrate that feedback is important, that we're not, you know, we're all learning, and it's not a threatening thing, and it's a give and take, and I need your help to and get better. And it's rare. I will tell you, for most people, that's a gobsmacking <laughs> suggestion. They're, they look at me like I have two heads, and then we talk about how it can actually really bring the power of vulnerability, bring the power of vulnerability uh, to, to, uh, to work for, for those relationships that are so important on the team. So... I think that brings us to our third ingredient, which mm. is candor. Um, so, you know, I love this expression, caring values the person. Candor values the person's potential. So how many of you, you know, put yes in the, in the Q&A if you can, how many of you have had a conversation with an employee over and over, it feels like deja vu, where, you know, you found yourself repeating things, and when you think about it, you think, oh, my God, why can't they just do X? But quite frankly, it often begins with us. We weren't frank enough or candid enough to begin with, looking to see if anybody relates Can to that. Can anybody relate to that? Maybe uh, that we have some experts in sandwich feedback where we, we put so much <laughs> niceness around the meat of the message that people walk away just hearing the nice part and not the meat of the message. I'm seeing some yeses in the chat panel, so you can... You can relate to what we're talking about. Exactly. Now, I mean, candid does not mean being unfiltered. We have to be respectful and, and have that lens of, of kindness as well. We do also need to flex our style to the individual and, and the situation because there's, you know, we the way we see the world is, is different one from the other. So, um, for instance, one person might see somebody as being particularly uh, assertive, you know, and feel that that's, that's that's real reasonable. Another person might see that same behavior as aggressive or even offensive. So, Tanya, you have a story to share with us. Yeah, I do have a story, and I just want to acknowledge people on the chat panel, and, you know, uh, Denise says, yes, it depends on the topic. So that's true. Some things can be more, you know, a, a lot easier to be candid about, and, and thank you, Jeanette, for saying, for sure, for sure she can relate to this conversation, <laughs> exclamation marks across the board. So thank you. Uh, yes, I have um, I had someone uh, – who I mentored, a solopreneur named Jim who wanted to improve his public speaking to sell his business services. So he'd come to me for feedback a couple of times, uh, asked me to listen to his podcasts and live videos. And at first, you know, I didn't know him well, so I was pretty gentle. And I mentioned that some of the filler words he was using and how it distracted from from his message. And at first he was really dismissive. And he was like, you know what, I just need to be spontaneous. I need to be real with my audience. But the third time he came to me and asked me to review his work, I just sat him down and I got real candid. I don't remember the exact words, but it was something like, listen, I know you want to gain clients for your business and I want you to be successful, but when you use ums and ahs and you know what I'm saying, you know, too many times in the course of a two-minute video, you know, frankly, you sound uneducated and inarticulate and you lose credibility. I, I simply would not hire you. He just sat there stunned. I felt really uncomfortable, and I was, te you know, kind of tempted to backtrack a little bit, but I did what we're talking about here. I just sat in the discomfort and let him absorb that, and what ended up happening is he went out, and he asked people for feedback, but this time very specific to what I had given him, and he came back, and he admitted that other people validated what I said, so it's just a reminder to me that, you know, everyone deserves our candor because, you know, people aren't going to get to excellence unless we're able to tell them 
uh, what we see. Now, at the end of the day, it still was still my opinion for his consistency. If I, it didn't give it specifically and directly enough, he just wasn't hearing it. So how you serve it up is going to depend on the person you're speaking with and the level of trust between you. But I find this, this conversation that we're having right now is really empowering because you know, to muster the courage to do this, it, it's helpful to remind ourselves of why it's so important. And those of you who responded to our survey, you helped us remember why this is important because we asked you, if leaders were more effective at performance conversations, what are the two to three results or improvements you would anticipate seeing? And again, here is a sample of some of the things you said. You know, we'd see more productivity. There would be more engagement. We'd have a happy environment. We'd be attaining our goals. I thought it was a really interesting comment around achieving succession plans. Um, like, as we said at the beginning, this is really about, you know, developing talent and creating talent for the future. So we need to keep these top of mind every time we feel stopped from giving someone candid and kind feedback. If there are any other thoughts that are coming up as we're having this conversation, feel free to enter them in the, um, in the Q&A panel. And I'm just taking a look and keeping an eye on whether there are questions. Um, so there is a question coming in from Sandy who says, would there be a better way to provide feedback to someone who would prefer a direct conversation? So I think that that is exactly what we're suggesting, but simply that um, we want to be direct because otherwise the message can get lost, but there is a way to do that with kindness and by creating safety by first sharing your intention for the person. So that lead into the conversation as to why it's important. And, and Denise is adding that regular consistent feedback would be another outcome that we would see if leaders were better um, at this, and I, and I fully agree. A feedback rhythm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not just once in a while. Yeah, so this is uh, really, really important for us to consider. So let's just recap this for a moment. A meaningful conversation begins with a clear outcome and positive intention for the other person. And for that intention to build trust and to make the conversation less scary, in other words, safer, we need to demonstrate curiosity, vulnerability, and candor. And on that note, I think we are ready to move to our Q&A section. I'm going to say up front, um, thank you everyone for your questions. We probably have more questions than we have time to respond, but I'm going to try to respond to as many as we can. So one simple question from Jackie. She asks, can you repeat the secret sauce? I had trouble with the audio, so uh, hopefully that um, wasn't for everyone. But absolutely, Jackie, the secret sauce that we talked about uh, to creating safety is leading with your intention. So making your intent clear. The example that Lisa used was if you want to give someone feedback rather than just simply saying, hey, can I give you some feedback, which can potentially sound critical or confrontational, we want to offer some insight into why you want to offer this feedback. So for example, it could be something like, hey, Jackie, I thought you did a great job kicking off your presentation. I have a few thoughts on how you might hold people's attention even more effectively to the end of your presentation. Are you interested in hearing some ideas? So this is really about making sure that your intention to be of service to them, to help their productivity or their performance is very clear at the beginning of that conversation. And really what that does, speaking to what Lisa was talking about with the lizard brain, it calms the lizard brain when people know why you're approaching them, and allows them to listen more fully. Um, because typically what we do in these conversations when we're feeling on the defense, we're not really listening to what the person's saying, we're listening to how we're going to respond. So the other piece of the secret sauce that we just said was making sure that you're approaching it with a curious mindset and that you're displaying vulnerability and candor. And I want to quickly respond to Bree, um, who asks, so even as a leader, it's okay to admit that a tough conversation is not comfortable? Yes, absolutely, 100%. Because at the end of the day, um, there is nothing served through bravado, right? We put a lot of pressure on ourselves as leaders that, uh, you know, we need to look like we have all the answers and bring our very professional game to the conversation. But when you admit that you're finding this conversation difficult, 
you turn yourself into a human being because at the end of the day, we can pretend we don't have feelings around it and that it doesn't make us nervous and everything, but it also gives permission to the other person because an employee is also nervous. They may put a tough exper- you know, exterior on, but it always is challenging to hear feedback. Um, so by saying, hey, you know, I have something to share, I'm going to admit this is a little bit challenging for me, it allows the other person to lower their guard when you do that. Now, it requires vulnerability. So, Michael, I'm speaking to you here because you said, isn't it risky if you're speaking to an employee with a strong personality to show vulnerability? I would say to you that vulnerability always feels risky, whether the person has a strong personality as well. Now, when we think back to when we asked you earlier in the webinar about someone who um, – you know, you can be honest with and who can be honest with you. And we said, you know, what allows that to happen? A lot of people said, well, because you have a relationship, you've known this person for a long time, and there's trust. So really the goal is, even with that person with the strong personality, isn't necessarily about being best friends with them. But it is about what you could do to build trust. And what's going to build trust over the long term is, in fact, showing that you're not perfect, that, you know, you're willing to take a risk and share some vulnerable things because you are committed to this person's um, development and to this person maybe making some changes for the sake of the team. So, yeah, leadership, no one ever said leadership is easy, and it does require us to put ourselves on the line from time to time. And speaking of that, um, let me just scroll down. There was another question here. Yeah, Kathy wanted to know, how can I get more comfortable doing this? I'm not good at these conversations. So, Kathy, get in line. You are one of many. Um, I don't think any of us are born being good at these conversations, nor are they comfortable, which is the reason why so many of you have registered for this uh, webinar. I think the first thing here, and it does require a certain amount of vulnerability, is to accept that it's going to be uncomfortable in some situations, and you probably are going to fail. Now, that sounds like a bad thing when I say fail. It's just that not every conversation is going to achieve the outcome that you set out. But as we know, uh, we don't learn anything without making some mistakes along the way and picking ourselves up, brushing ourselves off, and saying, that's okay, that's how we learn. Now, having said that, you can find safe places to practice. So, of course, representing CMC, I'm going to highly recommend one of our courses that we'll talk to you about at the end. But aside from training, there are other ways to get support. One of the ways that I learned when I first became a manager uh, was to find a mentor who I felt was really good and really comfortable being candid. Um, It was a woman who I didn't report to directly, but who was senior to me. And uh, she would have us role play. So I would talk to her about someone that I needed to give feedback to that was really scary and uncomfortable, and I was worried this person was going to have an emotional reaction that I couldn't manage. And she would sit me down and say, okay, let's play out the conversation. I'm going to play, I'm going to play the role of the employee. And I'll be honest with you, I absolutely dreaded role-playing, and most adults hate role-playing. But I can also tell you it was one of the most valuable exercises she ever put me through. Because even though you can't anticipate exactly what that person is going to say, just role-playing it, facing some potential challenges. So this woman's name was Debbie, who would role-play with me. She would she would purposely try to rattle me, and you know I had to recenter myself and go back to what is my intention for this conversation and keeping that top of mind to keep me centered on my message and not going into defensiveness or not going into reactiveness. So I hope that helps you, Kathy. Um, we had a few other questions, and I encourage you, if you're still with us, to enter those uh, questions in the Q&A panel. And uh, wait, there was one more here I wanted to get to. Yes, Yvette. So she said, quick, not so quick question. (laughs) Um, I have two team members that have lost trust in each other. I want to help them be able to work together again. Any Any tips? Okay, Yvette, that is not an easy question, but thank you for bringing it forward. there are a couple ways of approaching that, and I think you need to make a judgment call depending on the severity of the situation, so what was involved in the breaking of trust, as well as the maturity and the skill level of those two individuals. So if it's something rather serious, if you think these folks are, you know, can't manage that conversation, you may actually want to mediate it. And um, in that case, 
you know, you may want to borrow some tips and tricks from mediation. It can be things such as having those two individuals come together, and this is a really powerful way to create safety in the room too, um, is starting the conversation with each person, uh, sharing what they respect about the other person. Now, it sounds like maybe a, uh, you know, a place to start which you wouldn't have thought of, but by, by acknowledging what that person respects in the other person, even though they've lost trust in them, it could be something that they respect about their skill level or whatever. Remember, we're trying to calm that lizard brain, right? So if you start from a great place, whether it's with the intention or by sharing something you respect in the other person, then you can create some some safety, and then you might have each party share, um, you know, what it was that broke trust. Just make sure, and one of the things we emphasize in our course is that people are using I statements. So instead of saying, when you did this, um, Yvette, it's more like, when this happened, this is how I felt, or this is what it made me think, for example. And by using those I statements, again, we're taking responsibility, we're creating safety. Now, ideally, you're removed from this conversation, and these employees are able to give feedback to one another. And so this is, I think, what we want to get to. So being able to coach them on how to have that conversation, and I would take a lesson from my mentor, Debbie, sitting down with them and maybe role-playing that with them and then pointing out to them when they're maybe getting aggressive or defensive and sharing with them. this, you know, Having them listen to the recording of this webinar, um, if appropriate, uh, or other resources on our website to help them understand how do you communicate an intention because both of those employees need to at least have the intention that they want to work better together. They don't need to be best friends. They don't need to kumbaya, love one another, but they need to have the intention that they're going to get over this. They want to get over this in order to work more effectively. And then, of course, um, a plug for CMC. We have a lot of great courses around this. Send them to us. We'll help you work with them. But really, uh, coach them and, like I would say, you know, and maybe get some tips even from your internal HR folks or your EAP if you have a, an employee assistant program as well. Uh, there's a lot of different ways depending on the situation that's at play. So I don't know the details, but hopefully something in there um, is helpful to you. Um, Raul asks, how do we make time for feedback conversations? Okay, the time question. Love this one because it comes up all the time and it's tough. So one of the things I would say is that we need to recognize that giving feedback either in the moment or frequently is going to save us time as leaders down the road, right? We can all think about those projects where we kind of swept things under the rug, but then things blow up at some point because projects get derailed or you start to see the impact on individual engagement because here's the thing, folks. Employees, you have to know when they're struggling with something. And when we don't address it over time, that's going to erode confidence and then ultimately people's performance. So the sooner it's addressed, the more important, sorry, the, the, the more time and effort is really saved overall. But I know all of you as leaders, those of you as leaders, we're all busy. I mean, you have your day jobs on top of managing people. So I would say it really takes commitment, and it sometimes takes creativity. So in terms of commi commitment, make sure you're scheduling time to check in with people. And this doesn't have to be a one-hour conversation. This can be five to ten minute check-ins. And then the key is to honor your schedule. Um, you know, how many of us you know, schedule one-on-ones, and then we treat those meetings like they're kind of flexible, like if it doesn't happen today, we can reschedule it for tomorrow. We don't treat it necessarily as important as some of our other meetings. So honor your schedule, um, keep those commitments, and, and, and build it into your agenda. So not just your agenda one-on-one -on -one meetings, but you can build feedback into your team meetings as well because this is a powerful way to set the example with people that feedback is really important in our culture. So at the end of the meeting, you could just ask people, like, what would have made this meeting more effective? Um, you know, what feedback do you have for me as your manager or anyone else on the team? So make feedback part of your daily conversations. And finally, I would say, I talked about creativity. I'm thinking about a conversation I had with a woman, and she said, you know, I had to take a look at how I use my time and how in her organization they kind of automatically schedule meetings for 60 minutes, even if they don't need to be 60 minutes. So she started scheduling 45-minute meetings with the intention of using those 15 minutes as an opportunity to check in with people. So sometimes we need to take a look at how we're using our time and where we could find time or make time. Um, 
you know, at the end of the day, what we think is a priority is what's going to get done. So we really need to be committed to doing this and very clear on uh, what the benefits are. So um, let me just see here. We have probably time um, for another question here. So let's see, I'm just scrolling through quickly. Give me one moment. So there's another question coming in. How or when do you know the timing is right to provide feedback? Do you wait and assess work styles and see if you notice patterns of performance and bundle things together? Or do you address things immediately or close to when they happen? Too much feedback can be overwhelming or discouraging thoughts. Fantastic question. And I would say there's not one right answer, but if I was going to generalize, you want to give the feedback as closely as possible to when you've observed either the performance or the behavior. Now, there are some exceptions. If it's a situation that's very upsetting, I would say always give some time for people to de-escalate. Like if you've witnessed behavior that is you know, upsetting, for example, you want to take a breather, make sure that you're centered, make sure that your lizard brain is not... Um, you know, activated. But aside from that, I would say as quickly as possible because no, there's nothing worse than getting feedback um, either so far down the road that you can't even remember what this person's talking about or um, it's too late to do things differently. So you want to do it while it's fresh. And the more frequently you get in the habit of doing this, the more it's going to seem natural and the more your employees are going to expect it and the less threatening it's going to be. And I want to say, you know, it's really important to be also asking for feedback after, like, as the example that I gave, you know, after a meeting, what could I have done differently? At the end of a one-on-one -on -one meeting, what can I do differently to support you better? So making sure it's a two-way dialogue. So if you have a ton of feedback to answer the second part of this question, yeah, you don't want to say, hey, um, I got some great ideas about your presentation. Do you have a few minutes? And then pull out your laundry list of 12 things that they did wrong. Um, you're going to shut that person down entirely. So I would prioritize what are the top one or two things um, that are going to move the needle on this person's performance, even if it may be for now. It means overlooking some other things. And don't forget, a lot of times people know when they haven't picked it out of the, you know, out of the ballpark. So you can also say, I have some ideas. I would love to hear from you. What do you think went well? What do you think you can improve on? And you would be surprised sometimes that people can recognize it in themselves. Not everyone, um, but give them that opportunity. So maybe you don't have to list everything. And then you know, when they list one, a couple of things, you say, well, I, I agree with you. Let's talk about how we can improve that. And I have one or two other things you know, that I wanted to share with you. Um, I want to recognize that there, there are some other questions that we didn't get to. There's a few others, but uh, we want to respect your time. I also want to share with you that if you are looking for support, either for yourself or a member of your team, take a look here. Here are a few of our um, popular courses on this topic. You can see some dates listed. You can find more information on our website. We help people like you practice this stuff in a safe environment, get feedback from really highly trained facilitators, and we can do the same for your folks. And if you're thinking of sending any employees, remember one of the key ways to get a change in behavior is to talk to them before they attend training and tell them what you expect and then to follow up. So there's some tips on that. Um, Again, on our website, we have other free re uh, resources, whether it's articles or podcasts or recorded webinars. We've got more information, so please check us out, uh, www.cncoutperform.com. And this webinar is being, uh, has been accredited for a PDU. I will give you the information that you need to jot down if this is relevant to you. That slide will pop up at the end of our webinar. And I want to tell you that topics like this, we get the ideas from uh, folks like yourselves uh, in terms of what you're looking to learn, what challenges you're facing, uh, what content may be relevant to you. So please either click the um, survey widget on your screen or you'll be automatically uh, directed to the survey. And Finally, I want to just thank all of you. Thank you for making the time to support your own development, to, to, to have this conversation with us. Um, and uh, thank you for your questions and your participation. Thank you, Lisa, for all of your insights. I want to wish all of you a fabulous rest of day and best of luck in all of your conversations. And we hope to see you back on a webinar 
soon.